Wait. What happened to peace on earth, goodwill to everyone? And what about Jesus' words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you? Words that seem at odds with this morning's text. I came to bring fire to the earth. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. If you're looking for a warm and fuzzy Jesus, you may have to look elsewhere than this morning's text. It sounds more like a Jesus whose arthritis is flaring up or a Jesus who hasn't had his morning coffee yet. <laughs> Quick, get the man some extra strength Tylenol and a dark brew and make it a grande, maybe even a venti. That should do the trick. And if there are any cookies left, make sure he gets some. But all the pain reliever and coffee in the world won't change things. Not even fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. Jesus is looking to start a fire and there won't be any changing his mind about it. This morning's words make us nervous because when we think of fires, we think of lives lost in burning homes. We think of riots in the streets. We think of forests which have stood for no telling how long, providing home and sanctuary to all kinds of wildlife wiped out in the blink of an eye. Jesus the fire starter isn't nearly as appealing to our sensibilities as Jesus the Prince of Peace. So what do we do with this morning's text? Well, some preachers will skip over it. They'll look for another text that paints a more attractive picture of our Lord and Savior. One with dreamy eyes and outstretched arms. A Jesus surrounded by laughing children and crowds of people hanging on his every word. Others will misuse the text to their advantage. They may have discovered how effective fear is as a motivator. There's nothing like a good old hell, fire, and damnation sermon to whip the congregation into obedience. Some of you may have heard a sermon or two like that in your past. And a Jesus who calls for fire is just the sort of image that lends itself to the manipulations of these sorts of preachers. But not all fires are set maliciously and not Every fire destroys everything in its path. Some fires light the way for us when we are feeling lost. When the Israelites made their way through the desert wilderness, we read that God went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light. And in other places in the Bible, our times of trial are compared to the fire which refines gold and silver, making it pure and fit for an offering. But when I read this morning's text, I like to think of Jesus' fire imagery as being that of a controlled burning. Controlled burns have been around for thousands of years as a way of caring for the land we have been called to tend. In controlled burning, firefighters, farmers, or forestry professionals intentionally set fires to eliminate the undergrowth and overgrowth that can overpower the healthy vegetation. It removes the brush that would otherwise provide fuel for wildfires. Controlled burning actually helps to prevent the forest fires that ravage so much land and endanger lives. The same controlled burn principle can be applied to our own lives. Left to our own devices, our lives can become easily overrun with weeds of discord and crowded with the underbrush of a society that competes for our time, resources, and talents. We need to be purified and cleansed and made ready for new growth. 
When Jesus was calling for fire, that's what I believe He intended. A fire that would remove all the things that are blocking us from experiencing God's kingdom on earth. A fire that removes the weeds and underbrush that crowd out the nurturing light of God's love. Jesus was calling for a fire that would transform lives and religious landscape. But transformation means change, and there will always be resistance to change. Resistance marked by division. The sort of division between generations in which the older folks would like to hold on to that which has become familiar to them and the younger generation insists that an overhaul is the only solution. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Again, this isn't the sort of thing we want to hear from Jesus. We want a Jesus who calms the troubled waters of our souls. We've had enough of conflict. Our headlines are filled with it. But we need to resist the urge to gloss over the language in the Gospels about division and upheaval. Mary, the mother of Jesus, sang a song of upheaval with her Magnificat. God, you have scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. You have brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Or consider the blistering words of Jesus' predecessor. John the Baptist. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Like his mother and his mentor before him, Jesus was calling for a social, religious, and political upheaval that would raise up the poor and marginalized and knock down the powerful a peg or two. And that sort of thing always separates the haves from the have-nots. The haves will fight for their power and position with every ounce of strength they possess. They will not go down easily. And this is what Jesus was warning his followers about in this morning's text. Now there will always be those who live for conflict. It thrills their very souls. People who like to stir the pot. Angry people who call themselves activists but only use demonstrations and protests as outlets for their anger. Wounded people who want to wound others. People whose lives are so pathetic and empty their only source of entertainment is to embroil themselves in battle with others. I'll bet you know one or two people like this. These sorts of people latch on to this morning's text and use it as a license for conflict. They feel absolved from any pain they may create in the lives of people around them because after all, Jesus predicted this sort of thing, they will say. But divided families aren't the ultimate goal and burned up landscapes aren't the final picture. There's something that comes after that. It's the new growth that emerges from the charred terrain. It's the weapons that have been beaten into plowshares. It's the table where all are welcome. It's a world where black lives matter and trans lives are valued and women's rights are human rights and no human is illegal and kindness is everything and education is the key and love is, and love, is love 
is love is love. Once the fire di dies down and the smoke clears, we get a glimpse of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. The very thing that Jesus spent his whole life preaching about. Things will be better. But sometimes things have to get worse before they can get better. I think that may be the message that Jesus was giving to his people. Sometimes things have to be burned away from us to finally experience the arrival of the kingdom. May we never forget that a new dawn follows the night, that the promise of spring follows winter, and that God's love will sustain us until after the fire dies out and the smoke clears away. Amen.